Hey everyone, Detroit has a very rich and interesting history. What sparked interest in this topic were people using Detroit as some crude answer to the question, what happens when black people are the predominant demographic in a city? You could probably guess what kind of people I'm talking about. But it's not as simple as that, nothing ever is. This video started off with trying to squash that line of thinking, but then I became fascinated with the history of the city. In the end, I decided to let the history of Detroit speak for itself. In this video, I'll give a quick rundown of the beginning of Detroit, its industrial era, where it stands now, and where it might be going in the future. Established in 1701 by a French officer named Antoine de Lamont Cadillac on the west bank of the Detroit River, Fort Detroit was used as a fur trading post and for farming. Using captive natives as slaves, with the introduction of more African slaves later on, they developed the city, using them to plant crops and provided the labor for fur trade. The reason why we know this is due to records referencing slavery in journals, wills, and financial accounts. So <laughs> there you go, early Detroit had slaves. This was done for economic gain, but it was still messed up. <laughs> France was still doing slavery around this time, so this makes sense. The reason why it was built on the west side of the river was to prevent the British from moving into the west. This was before they realized they were Americans. Fort Detroit had a fair share of conflicts, but it was built for that. It was a fort, after all. In 1706, Cadillac was off somewhere, but in the meantime, some guy with a name I will definitely butcher was in charge. Uh, let's call him Bergmont. That's the easiest looking one there. When the Miami tribe took refuge inside the fort after an attack by the Ottawa, Bergmont ordered the soldiers to fight off the Ottawa's attack. The French saw the natives as allies and were their source of trade and survival, and so this conflict was seen as a big problem and Bergmont was criticized for it. Instead of making permanent settlements, they were more focused on trading posts like Fort Detroit. We have to keep our identity secret. Oh, I know you! You're that guy with that really long name! Oh. <sighs> Oh, hell no. Uh, Let's do the different breed. We're all deserters out here, and we'll run out of food at some point. If you want to survive, you better dig in. This doesn't mean every native tribe was cordial with the French. For example, you had the Fox, Sac, and Moscudans, who had a serious battle with the French and their native allies. After this big battle at Fort Detroit, the Fox and their allies fled the area as the French and their allies chased them. After a four-day siege in a new location, the Fox surrendered so the French could spare their families. The French agreed but soon attacked and killed them all after they were disarmed. A really dick move. This was known as the Fox Indian Massacre which set the stage for the Fox Wars in which the first war started in 1712 and ended in 1716 and then the more devastating one started in 1728 and ending in 1733. The second war was inevitable because the French enslaved many of the Fox and the French allied itself with tribes who were enemies with the Fox. The Second War nearly wiped the entire population of the Fox. However, a bigger power was coming for France, and that would be the British. The French and Indian War, which was part of many battles in the Seven Years' War between France and Britain, led to the French ceding Fort Detroit to the British in 1760. The British didn't care to make good relationships with the natives like the French somewhat tried to do. This led up to a war leader of Ottawa named Pontiac, who didn't like the British rule in the Great Lakes region, rallying warriors from many tribes to destroy eight British forts and killing hundreds of colonists. He was probably listening to doom music while doing this. He attempted to capture Detroit from the British in 1763, but the British knew the attack was coming. Despite that, Pontiac managed to put Detroit in a siege for two months. This lasted until 1764, when peace was negotiated over the next two years. Sometime after the American Revolutionary War, Fort Detroit was ceded to the United States in 1796. Until a fire in 1805 burned down Fort Detroit. This fire was believed to have begun near or in the staples of a local baker, perhaps by the hot ashes from a pipe. Who knows, maybe the person responsible moved to Ohio after this. Fort Detroit was full of wooden structures and that made it easy for the fire to spread and burn it all down. No one reportedly died, and the flag of Detroit carries a motto in reference to this event. Sparamus Meliora Resurget Cineribus, which means, we hope for better things, it will arise from the ashes. It would indeed do so. Judge Woodward prepared a city plan which was approved by Congress in April 1806. 
The design was based on a hub and spoke configuration which was designed by Pierre Charles L. Lafont. This allowed for further expansion of the city without interfering with the foundation of the plan. This is why Detroit is called the Paris of the Midwest. However, the eventual addition of freeways cut through the Spoke Avenue's design, but you can still make it out today. It took a minute, but now we're here. The city of Detroit has been built. In the next section, we'll see how Detroit became an industrial powerhouse. After Detroit was rebuilt, it would have some key roles in events leading up to its eventual industrialization. One role, for example, was during slavery, escaped slaves would travel to Detroit to cross the Detroit River into Canada via the Underground Railroad. It wasn't an actual Underground Railroad, it was more of a network using railroad terms. For example, the meeting points along the network would be called stations. Those assisting freed slaves were conductors, and the freed slaves themselves were cargo. When the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 passed, this made it so if any of them were captured, they would be sent to the South and you can probably guess it wouldn't be pretty. This meant freed slaves and those helping them were making a big risk in doing this. Leaving America was now a top priority and non-negotiable, and so Detroit was one of many jumping points to leave America. Detroit had safe houses which escaped slaves would use as a checkpoint before leaving. For example, you have the Second Baptist Church of Detroit and the First Congressional Church of Detroit. However, not every black person moved to Canada. There would be many who stay in Detroit because Michigan was a non-slave state. The majority of Detroit's population by 1863 was white people, but the few black people there found a way to thrive there. There would be two main papers at the time which reported everything from their respective political ideology. The Detroit Free Press at the time was Democrat ran and the Detroit Advisor and Tribune was Republican ran. Both parties were different at this time. The Republican paper supported Abraham Lincoln and wanted him to get more radical in eradicating slavery, supporting black people's rights, and letting them help in the war effort. The Democratic paper didn't like Abraham Lincoln, made constant white supremacy statements, and wanted slavery to continue. Hey, yeah, get out of here, lost cause. Liar, Liar that's, that's not what my party is. These papers added to the already growing tension there in Detroit. The free press was more interested in attacking black people by portraying them as inferior and a threat which reflected how many white people saw the black population there at the time. A mixed race man named Thomas Faulkner, who was seen as black because of the one drop rule most likely, was arrested for allegedly touching a young white girl and was tried in court. Two girls made testimonies which played a big role in getting him arrested. His trial attracted a huge crowd of angry white people and this created a very tense courtroom setting. The crowd would get bigger and rowdier to the point that if a black person was just walking by, they would get beaten by the crowd. The crowd would throw bricks and paving stones at Faulkner and his escorts as they moved to and from the courthouse. Eventually, the Detroit Provost Guard was caught into an escort him, and the commander decided to order a round of blanks to be shot at the crowd. But somehow during the second round of firing, a live round would be used. A German man who wasn't a part of the mob was killed and this started the first of many riots in Detroit. The white crowd immediately attacked black people on the streets and destroyed many black owned businesses. They even looted and stole from these businesses and after they were done there, they went to poor white areas and continued the destruction there. Out of the estimated 15 to $20,000 worth of damages, most of it would be in black areas. Faulkner would be sentenced to life in prison but the girls who gave testimonies of his alleged assault revealed they made it up years later. So upon that late revelation, he was pardoned. He was able to return to his usual life afterwards. After this riot, Detroit established a full-time police force full of white people because black people weren't allowed to be police officers, of course. This event made it clear that Detroit was going to have this racial undertone moving forward. Detroit was located near the Great Lakes region, so this made it a hotspot for commerce and global trade. It linked the Great Lakes system of waterways to the Erie Canal and to rail lines. Pharmaceutical firms and manufacturing plants, for example, Park Davis, the Frederick Stearns Company, and Global Tobacco would make their stay in Detroit. By the 1890s, cast iron stove manufacturing became Detroit's top industry, dubbing it the stove capital of the world. Detroit was expanding like crazy, building houses along Woodward, building Victorian structures, and lots of churches in such a short amount of time. Detroit was home to a lot of immigrants such as Irish, Germans, Belgian, and Polish, 
who made their own businesses and communities in their respective areas in Detroit. It wouldn't be until the 1900s when Henry Ford's automobile industry would spark a drive to make automobile manufacturing plants. Once again, Detroit was in a great regional spot, so it naturally became the center of the American automobile industry, and it will earn the name the Motor City. Lots of workers would come to Ford's plants because he would announce that he would pay them $5 a day, which was double the amount of other plants, and this allowed the Model T to dominate in this industry. What led to this was the union organizers forming to criticize Henry Ford in regards to workers' rights. A German-American Protestant minister wrote in his diary, The foundry interested me particularly. The heat was terrific. The men seemed wary. Here manual labor is a drudgery and the toil is slavery. We all want things which the factory produces, and none of us is sensitive enough to care how much in human values the efficiency of modern factory costs. Ford decided to pay relatively high wages with benefits such as vacations and retirement and this increased satisfaction and productivity. This rapidly growing industry needed more labor to support it and immigrants from Europe were filling a lot of the labor demand but immigration acts in 1921 and 1924 drastically decreased the amount of them coming over to work. A quota was set to 2% of the total number of people of each nationality in the United States except for immigrants from Asia. The Japanese were specifically barred from entering. The goal was to preserve the ideal U.S. homogeneity, but in return it hampered the labor force here. Black people who wouldn't have been hired otherwise will be hired to fill that decreased labor market, and this caused a great migration, which many black people moved to Detroit to work for Ford. The black population in Detroit would shoot from 40,000 to 1,400,000 by 1930. The Great Migration would continue up until 1970, in which the black population in Detroit would rise to 660,000 people. This led to a severe housing shortage, and so public housing for auto workers was created to combat this. The wealth generated from the automobile industry, along with educational and technological advancements, led to a rapid creation of downtown Detroit businesses. Shopping districts up along Park Avenue, Broadway, and Woodward. Multiple hotels were constructed, the Fox Theater and the Fillmore Detroit, Orchester Hall, the Detroit Public Library, and the Detroit Institute of Arts were springing up left and right. The drafts for World War II decreased the labor market so much that they began hiring more black workers. With the increased black workers in the area and limited housing supplies, this began this very damaging housing war. White Detroiters were against integration and wanted to defend their neighborhoods from black home buyers. Landlords saw this as an opportunity to gouge out the monthly rent prices in black neighborhoods, having black tenants pay more for rent than white tenants in equally valued apartments. Black people didn't have the disposable income to afford the upkeep and repair of their rental properties. This meant over time black neighborhoods became overcrowded, lack water and ventilation, infested with rodents, and prone to fires. White Detroiters would fight President Roosevelt's New Deal, which would have alleviated the housing crisis by subsidizing the construction of public housing and private single-family homes because they thought it disturbed the racial and architectural homogeneity of their neighborhoods. Not only was redlining a thing here, there was also a political identity white Detroiters adopted to combat black Detroiters who sought to expand their communities, with violence included. The city's administration even reflected this thought process. Mayor Albert Cobo at the time announced that he will stop all public housing development outside of heavily black inner city neighborhoods, ultimately preventing the integration of the neighborhoods, and you can see why Cobo Hall got his name changed to the TCF Center. This solidified the further ghettoization of black neighborhoods. The Homeowners Loan Corporation, which subsidized home purchases and improvements with low interest loans in order to protect home ownership from foreclosure, excluded black people from private home ownership, which is an example of the previously mentioned redlining. This is why to this day you can still see that line that separates black and white neighborhoods in Detroit. Here's the racial demographics of Detroit. While some parts are getting fuzzy, the fact that you can still make out the lines show how much of a stain this is. Black Detroiters fought hard to expand and improve their circumstances, but in the end, they had no choice but to stay in low quality neighborhoods and fight a losing struggle. After the war, Detroit lost about 1,500 jobs to the suburbs. This was due to things such as increased automation, consolidation of the auto industry, and taxation policies. The construction of freeways would make it easier for people to move out of the city of Detroit. Major and smaller companies would go out of business. 
and in the 1950s, the unemployment rate would hover over 10%. The new auto plants would be opened in the suburbs between 1946 and 1956, and this caused the white workers to chase these jobs. Despite all the prosperity Detroit received, it's the treatment of black people during this time, who are now a large percentage of the demographic there, that will set the groundwork of what would happen next. Racial tensions were high and understandably so. There was only so much redlining and corruption a population was going to take before they take action. Detroit public schools were suffering from underfunding and racial discrimination. The racial discrimination is self-evident by now, but the underfunding happened due to the decreasing tax base as, if you can recall, the largely white workers moving to the suburbs. Without enough people paying taxes, funding for these schools decreased. And during this, the student population increased, which caused more problems. With a smaller class, teachers could spend more time with each student to make sure they learned the material, but too many students and the underfunding of schools caused poor quality of education for the students here. During this time, police brutality was rampant towards black people in Detroit. A survey conducted by President Johnson's Kerner Commission found that leading up to the riot, 45% of the police working in black neighborhoods were extremely anti-black, and an additional 34% were prejudiced. Keep in mind, the police force excluded black people from joining it when it formed, so it's no surprise that it would be 93% white by 1967. The several shootings and beatings of black people were so bad that black people reported that police brutality was the number one issue they faced in Detroit over the housing problems. The Detroit police is a racist militia. <laughs> no, we're not. What the heck, guys? Why are you just standing there and not harassing black people? This racial inequality, police brutality, and corruption were bubbling up under the surface, but it will take one more incident to make it explode. On a Sunday at 3.45 a.m., July 23rd, 1967, Detroit police officers raided an unlicensed weekend drinking club called a Blind Pig. It was like a speakeasy, which many others had quite a role during Prohibition. The police expected only a few of them inside, but found 82 people instead, celebrating the return of two local GIs from the Vietnam War, and decided to arrest everyone there. Outside, a crowd of onlookers gathered while witnessing the raid, and a doorman named William Walter Scott III, whose father was running the blind pig, threw a bottle at a police officer and this started the riot of 1967, which lasted five days. It was one of the worst riots in United States history at the time. 43 people died, 1189 were injured, over 7200 people were arrested, and more than 400 buildings were destroyed. This caused 40 to 45 million dollars in damages. This will only fuel the already declining condition of Detroit. While the white flight began before this, this is when we will see a sharper decline of white people in the city of Detroit. The riots results weren't completely bad. More black people were hired into previously discouraged positions. By 1972, about 14% of police officers were black in Detroit. People felt employers became more fair. The automakers and retailers lowered the entry-level job requirements. The Michigan Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968, which prohibited discrimination of race, color, religion, disability, familial status, national origin, and sex during the sale, rental, financing, or insuring of houses. Personally, I wouldn't call it a rebellion because it was an indiscriminate destruction of anything in sight and looting. What I have in mind of what a rebellion comprises of is a clear goal with actions to get there. For example, the slave rebellion in Haiti. I am aware people will see this differently because the debate of whether or not this was a riot or a rebellion still continues to this day. This falls under personal interpretation. Detroit in the 1970s and 1980s will see more of the decline of the white population as they left Detroit after the riots. This meant black people found themselves in control of a city with an inadequate tax base and few jobs. Detroit's unemployment, poverty, infant mortality rose during this time. Detroit's first black mayor was elected in 1974 and remained in office until 1994, so he will be in office during Detroit's lowest point in recent times. People say Mayor Coleman Young had a far-left political campaign, but that's because he hung around leftist unions. He will become mayor by a very thin margin. 
92% of black people voted for him and 91% of white people voted for his opponent. So he figured he had to appeal to everyone to heal the racial divide there. He integrated the police force and attempted to resolve the racial tensions between the city and the suburbs. But due to how outspoken he was on racial issues, this just turned white people away. He supported the construction of many Detroit landmarks including the Joe Louis Arena, Renaissance Center, and the Detroit People Mover, and used eminent domain to purchase and raise a 465 acre inner city neighborhood named Town to make way for a $500 million General Motors Cadillac assembly plant. He felt there was no other option but to do this because he wanted to rehabilitate the downtown business district. However, neighborhood activists opposed what he was doing because he was taking money out of neighborhoods. During this time, crime became a big problem in Detroit. Dozens of violent black street gangs gained control of the city's large drug trade, which led to the heroin epidemic of the 1970s and grew into an even larger crack cocaine epidemic of the 80s and 90s. Many times, Detroit was named the arson and murder capital of the United States, which is why people blamed Mayor Coleman Young for not doing enough to stop this. The problem is complicated because crime and poverty are positively correlated, so it was inevitable that a poverty-stricken city would have a crime problem. It was so bad that FBI crime statistics list Detroit as the most dangerous city in America during Young's time as mayor. When many people, including black people, left the city, it left a ton of abandoned buildings which attracted crime. It was unfortunate, but Detroit's decline was set in motion before Mayor Coleman Young got into office. Although he couldn't fix things, he took a swing at a very difficult task. It's been a journey, huh? And I'm all out of my pink drink. <laughs> We're going to see more of that trend of revitalizing downtown Detroit. This includes restorations for certain historic buildings. Construction such as Comerica Park and Fort Field, one of which placed the Lions Stadium in the city since 1978, and companies like Compuware and Quicken Loans would establish their world headquarters in Campus Marshes, which is located in downtown Detroit. This was done in hopes to drive people to Detroit to improve its economic problems. However, Detroit would file for bankruptcy in 2013 with approval of Governor Snyder because it was in $18.5 billion of debt. But it still continues to face financial problems, housing foreclosures, and unemployment in the area of the city outside of where the development is occurring. In 2014, the Detroit Water and Sewage Department began cutting off water to homes with unpaid bills over $150, or if the payment was more than 60 days overdue. As of the recording of this video, more than 15,000 homes have been shut off, which could pose sanitation risks. As of now, Detroit is still on a population decline, with 2020 being the biggest decline in recent years. Okay, so where Detroit stands now, it's slowly recovering, but it still has a lot of problems that need addressing. If you want my answer to what happened to Detroit, it was the corruption, deindustrialization without anything to fill that gap, and racial discrimination. It's a shell of his former self, but it's a bit better than its lowest point. I know that's not saying much because the problems it's experiencing is still prevalent. And yeah, while the crime isn't as high as it was in the 80s, Detroit is still listed as the most dangerous city in America. This depends on which area you're in. Obviously, some are better than others. I have heard you can avoid most of the crime by being an early bird. I think this could change with the further development of Detroit. As poverty goes down, Detroit's crime rates will follow, and I do believe this could happen within the next decades. You might be wondering what could be the solutions to this problem. Currently, the city administration is continuing to bring investment into the downtown area, and I'm sure that will begin to bleed into the surrounding neighborhoods. Whenever Detroit begins demolishing abandoned houses and fixing the neighborhoods, the cost of living will rise and might hurt those who can't afford it. This is what is called gentrification. When wealthier people move in, houses get improved, and new businesses get started in the area, that will ultimately displace the poor people who've been living there. I'm mixed on gentrification because it's a process that will improve an urban area, but those who were originally there and suddenly can't afford to be there will be forced to move elsewhere. I'm sure everyone will have their fun takes on that in the comics section. Other than that, give it time. I believe Detroit can recover. Like the model of the Detroit flag says, 
We hope for better things. It will arise from the ashes. I'm sure it will. If you want to keep the channel going or help fund my upcoming series, you can become a patron. The link is down below and any amount is greatly appreciated. Anyways, I gotta go. Be nice to one another and take care of yourselves.